Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Billy Kelly. I'm the chair of the National Academic Integrity Network here in Ireland. And you're all very welcome right okay, to uh, this webinar. This event is jointly hosted by Quality and Qualifications Ireland, otherwise Q QQA, and QAA in uh, the UK, reflecting our respective 10th and 25th anniversaries in 2022. Uh, this event is included in Ireland's National Academic Integrity Week program, um, and it's been recorded. And today is an auspicious day for other reasons as well. It is the Carnegie Council's Global Day of Ethics, and it's also the International Centre for Academic Integrity's Day of Action Against Contract Cheating. And the context for this webinar is really the recent criminalisation of SA Mills in England and Ireland. And it, this has been an important step towards protecting students and staff in higher education from predatory companies selling cheating services. But it's important to recognize that this is just one part of a multifaceted solution to a very complex uh, problem. Um, recently, I heard Sarah Eaton describe uh, this whole area as a wicked problem. And I think it's a very useful way of, of considering this, right, okay, that there, there is no single solution. There may not ever be a perfect solution. There will be multiple solutions that will very much depend on the context from which we're, we're coming. We've assembled a panel today which will consider the broad question of what can be done at institutional level to promote academic integrity and combat academic misconduct. And I'll just introduce you right okay to the panel. Uh, the panel includes Dr. Helga Neal, who is Director of Higher Education Integrity Unit in Tertiary Education and Quality Standards uh, Agency, TEXA from Australia. We have Professor Michael Draper, who's Professor of Legal Education and Director of the Swansea Academy of Inclusivity and Learner Success at Swansea University. We have Clodagh McGivern, who's the Vice President for Academic Affairs of the Union of Students in Ireland. We have Steph Lomas. Steph is the Advice and Insights Coordinator at the University of Central Lancashire Student Union. Uh, me, I'm Billy Kelly, I'm Chair of the uh, National Academic Integrity Network. And that network itself, right, okay, is a, uh, it's a peer-driven network of members drawn from students, academic and professional staff across the Irish higher education sector. And we're also going to hear from Eve Alcock, the Head of Public Affairs at QAA, and Mairead Boland, the Senior Manage Manager for Academic Integrity in QQI. And what they will do is they will give uh, an overview of academic integrity legislation in England and Ireland uh, uh, as we come to it. So I'm going to start, right, okay, by inviting uh, uh, Helen Ganeel, right, okay, to give an international perspective. And as many of you will know, uh, Australia has really led the charge, right, on academic integrity issues in recent years. And Helen's going to talk to what has happened since the introduction of legislation in Australia. Helen, the Thanks, floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for the opportunity to, um, to come today. So it's just over two years since legislation was introduced in Australia that makes it an offence to offer or advertise cheating services to students enrolled with an Australian higher education provider. So I'll talk um, about what has been achieved in a moment, but I just wanted to make a couple of other points before I do that. And, and the first is to just really reinforce what Billy's just said. It's absolutely true that you cannot prosecute your way out of the problem posed by commercial cheating services. But that doesn't mean that there's no value in having legislation in, in place, because the alternative is that we simply allow these criminal enterprises to ply their trade in plain sight um, without fear of consequence and to entice our students to engage with criminal enterprises. So I think having legislation is a really important part of an overarching national strategy. And secondly, you know, what we found in Australia was just the drafting of the law itself um, really, really allowed extensive dialogue to happen in the Australian community. So it made a lot more people outside the education sector aware of the problem. And then the, the, the decision by the Australian government to establish the higher education integrity unit that I lead, and so to provide that central coordination point with sufficient funding to drive forward the use of the legislation has really helped us um, make some progress. 
So what has happened in Australia since the legislation was introduced? Um, so in September 2021, just over a year ago, we were successful in our first application to the Federal Court of Australia. And that was where we sought an injunction requiring the internet service providers to block access to a website that we had assessed as offering commercial cheating services. So in parallel, while that was happening, we also sought to understand the scale and the nature of the problem through data. So we, um, we work really closely in partnership with our sector. That's been a, a really um, important part of what we do. And the sector had already started to accumulate a database of sites that they suspected offered cheating services, and they handed that over to my team. Um, and so we then um, took over curating that site that we share back with our institutions every six months. Um, that, web, that database currently has over 2,300 websites suspected of offering cheating services. And we established a web traffic analytics function. So that allows us to monitor those sites and determine which websites receive the most traffic. So we can find the big fish, if you like, for targeting our enforcement action. It allows us to look at where the seasonal peaks are, um, year on year trends with how these services are being used, uh, the search terms that students use to find these services, uh, which social media platforms are sending students there through advertising. So it's allowed us to, to get a much better size of the scale and the shape of the problem. So based on that first successful federal court injunction, we then collaborated with the leading internet service providers in Australia, and we signed protocols with them. Um, so we've got, we cover about 98% of the, uh, the mobile and broadband networks with our protocols. And that allows us to make direct requests to the internet service providers without having to go through the court system, which is really you know, slow and expensive. Um, so since August this year, so in the last two months, we've blocked access to 150 websites offering cheating services. And because we set up the web traffic analytics, these were targeted blocks. So collectively, those 150 websites that we blocked made up over 70% of all Australian traffic going to um, essay writing websites that target Australian students. And so we're also investigating a number of operators with a view to prosecutions. But I mentioned at the start that, you know, you can't simply prosecute your way out of the problem. So um, I just wanted to finish, I guess, by highlighting the crucial partnership that my unit has with our sector. And we share intelligence bi-directionally. They tell us when they see sites, we share the database back with them every six months. And we also support higher education staff and students with a range of um, best practice resources, um, advice on how to combat this problem. We have a student facing page to help them identify and avoid illegal cheating services, and also a range of resources that we've translated into 12 different languages to help students really understand why cheating is never the right answer. Thank you very much, Billy. Uh, thank you, Helen, right, okay, for that, for that overview. And in some sense, it, Sets a target, right? Okay, for the rest of us, right? Okay, to follow in 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 some way. What we're going to turn to now, and I should have said this at the beginning for uh, for any participants. Please put your questions in the chat, and we will deal with them, right? Okay, at at, at the end. But what we're going to do now is we're going to look in turn, right? Okay, at the situation in the UK and then the situation in Ireland. And we're going to kick off, right, OK, with uh, Eva Alcock, right, OK, who's going to give us an overview of the UK legislation, right, OK, that uh, criminalises um, uh, the cases in England. Eve, the floor is yours. Thanks, Billy. Um, I won't take up too much time, but hopefully just enough to give you a sense of the legislative context in England. So earlier uh, this year, I think it was about April time, the Skills and Post-16 Education Act received royal assent, which includes clauses in it that criminalise essay mills in England. Um, so what does the legislation mean? It means that it is an offence to provide or arrange for someone else to provide a service that completes all or part of any assignment that contributes to any post-16 qualification. Uh, so it's not just higher education university, it's any post-16 qualification. The service must be performed under commercial circumstances, i.e. performed as part of a business, and the legislation covers both essays produced but also examinations as well, um, because it's that sort of broad definition of any assignment rather than just an essay specifically. Um, the Act also makes it an offence to advertise 
uh, SAML services as well as to provide it. And that means that you don't have to have evidence of the provision of that service in order to prosecute. If an SAML has a website, effectively, they're advertising and that in itself uh, is illegal under this act. Um, and crucially, what this legislation means is that it signals to students that SA mills or these providers are criminal entities, basically, um, and that in itself should be able to act as a deterrent. Um, I can just see quick question. The act, I believe, is the Skills and Post-16 Education Act. I can put that in the chat at the end um, when I finish speaking as well. If that's helpful. So what was QAO's role in making it happen? Um, it was a culmination of a sort of five year campaign by, by QAA uh, led predominantly by my predecessor in post. And we worked closely with Michael Draper and others across the sector to make it happen. Um, part of our involvement was making sure that it covered all post 16 provision and wasn't narrow just to a uh, sort of university um, and also ensured that it was a strict liability offence that means that SA mills effectively can't use disclaimers to say that they sort of didn't know or they didn't mean to to wriggle out of it um, and I'm really key to what we were trying to make sure happen as well is that we weren't prosecuting students as a result of the act. So the students themselves cannot be prosecuted or charged. That was really, really important to us. It is the entity that is providing the service um, that is prosecuted. So a quick future look then. Uh, crucially, it's important to note that this legislation at the moment only applies in England. So we're, we're working closely with the governments of other nations to ensure that we get that UK uh, wide coverage. Um, but ministers are in the nations are enthusiastic about that. I think it's just a case of working out when the right moment is or the right legislation to make sure that that gets put into it. So we'll continue those conversations to try and get that UK wide. And then our work on academic integrity more broadly continues. We are one of the endorsing organisations for the newly launched GAIN, um, Global Academic Integrity academic integrity network um, and we also have an academic integrity charter across the UK with over 200 signatories demonstrating a clear sector commitment to this topic uh, across the UK um, and I guess time will tell whether or not the act results in any prosecutions um, there are a few barriers there, I guess, that we, you've got to prove that those SMLs are England based. Lots of them that are advertising to students might not be England based um, and local police teams are the ones that would need to uh, effectively do the process of prosecuting them. Um, but we're looking into ways that we can make sure that this is obviously an effective piece of le legislation. It's really interesting to hear from Helen just now about uh, the unit that, uh, that she leads that actually helps kind of get across some of those barriers so uh, maybe in the future in in england and in the uk there's there's a model like that that could be replicated but yeah hopefully that gives you um some context uh for the legislation in england thank you thank you, thank you very much for that um uh, cook's tour right okay of of where we are I'm now going to turn right okay to get the student perspective and uh, Steph, Steph Lomas, right, okay, is going to talk to us about the concerns regarding academic integrity for, for students, right, and how we support students undergoing investigation for academic misconduct. And I would say it, this is a really important context, right, okay, in terms of um, following from, from, from what Eve had said, that students in many cases, right, okay, are the victims here rather than the perpetrators. Yes, they do. They, may have engaged with misconduct, right, okay, but they're being actively targeted by some of these services. Anyway, Steph, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Um, so, hello everyone, my name is Stephanie. I am an advising insight coordinator for UConn Students' Union, which means that I currently advise students who go through processes like academic misconduct. Previously, I was a vice president of education and worked with the uh, Q QAA on um, legislation that we've just heard about, which is very exciting and their support was amazing. I want to talk about it from a student point of view, because one, I was vice president of education, so I know what students were saying to me, but two, I'm also an advisor, so I see what happens to students afterwards, after the, after the uh, 
the academic misconduct has been caused. But I want to talk about it in two slightly different ways. First of all, I want to give two quotes, if that's possible. Hayden Fry advises that in football, like life, you must learn to play within the rules of the game. And Bill Shankly advises that football is a simple game, but it is complicated by people who should know better. So what do I mean by that? Are our policies on academic misconduct accessible to our students? Are we giving them the rules of the game in which they must play with before the first whistle is blown? That is the end of the football analogies, I promise. When I say accessible, again, I don't just mean available. Do your communities of students understand the limitations? Would a student who has joined a university sector from simply their GCSEs and experience understand what is meant by commissioning of data fabrication? Or would a student from an international background whose nation has differing definitions on academic misconduct understand what you are asking them to do? If you cannot confidently say yes, or you haven't even engaged with students on it to understand their point of view, rethink it, now is the time to be innovative. Do we even explain the risks associated with poor academic misconduct? If students don't know the consequences of these actions and the dangers of these actions, are we giving them the information to make reasonable decisions with their lives? Think about how you talk to students about academic misconduct. Do you only talk to undergrads about it at the beginning of the academic year? Do we even consider that postgraduates come from different nations with different rules? Do we give students a safe space to practice, or as we call it, a soft place to land? Do we give them the opportunities to practice the skills we talk to them about and give them an opportunity to make mistakes and signpost them to support? Do we tell them once or do we tell them all the time? I don't know about anyone else, but when I was at university, whatever I heard about during September, I'd completely forgotten in October because there's so much information coming at once. We need to keep reminding students not only about the rules of the game, but how they can access support and keep reassuring them that it's not deemed as a failure to ask for support. In fact, it is a measurement of success to be confident enough to ask for that support especially for communities where asking for help and failure is seen as a huge issue. It should, not, it should be celebrated to ask for support. Do, um, do we interact with students where they are? We know that students are on TikTok now, I believe, that's what I've heard. But TikTok isn't just about recruitment videos showing the endless opportunities that students get through education. This is such an effective tool of informing students of the dangers of the things that we're discussing today. It's no longer useful nor fair to ignore the issue that is happening. If you're ignoring the fact or denying that academic misconduct happens in your institute, then you're simply letting your colleagues and your students down. It happens everywhere, regardless of whether you want to admit it or not and to deny it is dangerous. These are commun communication opportunities that you can use to inform students where these SA mills are because the SA mills are on these websites. If you are there too, at least you are managing or at least attempting to manage the issues that are being promoted there. But educational institutes also have influence, influence more than many student unions have in lobbying or asking search engines to not profit from essay mills or paraphrasing tools. You have the power to ask people or to promote change and say this is no longer something that money should be made from, it's unethical, unethical should I say. You need to again keep reassuring students but now I'm going to go on to what happens during a misconduct. If you tell a student that they're being referred for an academic misconduct, 
Don't leave the communication there and cut it short. Explain what it means and encourage both advice and well-being support. The amount of students that advisors will see around the country who have students panicking about what this means because they don't understand is heartbreaking. Students need to have the information to make reasonable decisions. And with that, as much information as possible needs to be given to the student in order for advice to be given. Unfortunately, advisors are not mind readers. We do not see what the marker sees, hence why we're not academics. So we need to understand where the concern has been brought from so that we can tell the students advice and give them information for them to make reasonable decisions about their journey. But after a hearing, regardless as to whether it has been found or proven or not, how do we support students afterwards? Do we surround them with academic support? Maybe it's a lack of academic confidence and they need to know and feel as though they can go to these services. Do we give them wellbeing support? Do we give them the opportunity to go to someone and say, the reason this happened is because of an external factor that's affecting my well-being. Give them the opportunity to access that support and know about it. Do we give them the confidence? Anyone that has been um, alleged to have caused academic misconduct or, not, or has been found proved and knows that it affects one's confidence. They think, can they do anything right? They've tried their hardest with this essay and it's not gone, to, it's not gone well. We need to give them the confidence that making mistakes happens, but the success is from learning from them. The failure is from making them again. And we need to give them the reassurance that the university or other educational provider believes in them still. They feel like public enemy number one afterwards. So we need to give them the belief that we think that they can do the assignment or complete the degree. And this is just a rocky patch which will afterwards be smooth sailing as long as we make sure we're wrapping them with support. I think that's all I have to say on this. I think it's really important again to make sure that we're giving students the information to play the game because this isn't just a game. For some of our students this is life and death. For some of our students this is the difference between being able to get a job that supports their family and not having the confidence to reach for the stars, which is all, which is what education is all about. It's about transforming our lives through education. And if we don't give them the support and the rules to make those decisions, we're not helping them transform. We're crumbling their confidence. Thank you. Steph, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, I'm definitely. I'm telling you in advance. I'm going to. I'm going to pick up your Bill Shankly um, thing. I think that's a really important point uh, in terms of it. One of the real challenges, right? Okay, that institutions often aren't good at is actually explaining to students in terms in which they can understand, right? Okay, uh, what constitutes misconduct. Anyway, we're 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 going to continue. And um, Michael Draper is going to talk about the institutional perspective in the UK. What are institutions doing to respond to academic uh, misconduct? Michael. Thanks, Billy. Uh, thanks very much, Steph. That was brilliant as always. Um, I think I'm going to start by referencing the QAA and uh, some of the uh, material that Eve has already referred to. The QAA have some great resources and have developed some great networks around academic integrity. And those resources definitely worth checking out because they will help both staff and students at institutions uh, to succeed and to support each other in their academic journey. I think what I'd like to reference is the QA Charter, which was adopted in 2020 uh, in relation to academic integrity. It, as Eva said, has been signed up to by most institutions within the UK and along with the UK uh, QA Quality Code. Uh, and other guidance issued by the QA forms a, a very broad framework of principles in which institutions uh, can operate. So I would recommend referencing those particular documents, including the Academic Integrity Charter as a place to start institutionally 
uh, as to where you uh, might look. Institutions themselves have organized internally, but also externally. So many institutions have formed networks within regions within England, certainly in Scotland, uh, and in Wales, where I'm based, we now have the uh, Welsh uh, Integrity and Academic Network made of all higher education institutions and FE colleges with degree awarding powers in Wales as participants in that network. Uh, and here I have to acknowledge grateful support from Claire O'Neill from HEFCU, who fund that network, and of course, Holly Thomas from QA supporters, and my co-chair, uh, Dr. Uh, Mike Reddy as well. But these networks of institutions, they are basically communities of practice plus. They're, they are spaces in which we can discuss real issues and ensure that we have student representation on those networks in equal parity to uh, members of staff to ensure that those discussions are real. We have to have honest conversations and that was the basis around which the Welsh network was set up. Clearly told us quite clearly, we want real conversations, please. And what I find this network uh, very useful for is that Yes, it's minuted, Chatham House rules, but those minutes are sent then to HEFCU, the funding, uh, the, the regulator, as well as QAA, and help to inform the policy makers around future guidance, which I think is uh, essential. Uh, in terms of institutional work, uh, there are many colleagues across the UK doing some really good work in their institutions. So I just want to mention a few, Thomas Lancaster, Irene Glenn Denning, Sandy Dan, and uh, Robin Crockett uh, as a few. Within my institution, I just want to name check uh, Adrian Lovis, uh, Kerry Penhale and Steve McVeigh. Why I'm doing this is because at Swansea, we've taken the UK Academic Integrity Charter very seriously. We had an institutional webinar and session launching the charter. And now this year, we've set up four work streams across the institution. We're going to have a root and branch look at everything we do in terms of academic integrity and academic misconduct. The two need to be kept separate because they are different things. Misconduct and integrity are different principles, but both need to be addressed and both need to be supported. So we're going to be looking at policy and regulations as one works round. Are they fit for purpose? Do we really need that penal approach to outcomes as an academic misconduct panel that we do have? Do we need to treat plagiarism uh, as basically uh, as something that occurs, as Steph points out, because we haven't perhaps supported our students in terms of their learning? Have they inadvertently done this and fall into the trap of plagiarism? In which case we need to have a, an attitude of speed awareness courses that we now have speeding, of course. We're not penalized with, with an outcome that goes onto our record, so to speak. But also we're looking at restorative justice. This is an idea of traction gaining internationally around which students if they are found to have plagiarized inadvertently or, or perhaps that they've deliberately done so, they actually then take a role within the institution of championing academic integrity. They look at what they can do to support their community because we are talking around communities of learners. Students know what are going on and we need to actually support students in their learning and, and support those that actually go about their business in the right way. So I think we need to look at what we do in terms of um, our policies and regulations around that. Uh, equally, we need to look at our procedures uh, and our uh, systems for, for reporting as well that support those policies and procedures to make sure they are fair and they're operating properly and are properly resourced uh, and staffed. With, with, as Steph said, uh, language that students are going to understand <laughs> you know not everybody's a trained lawyer I think everybody should be a trained lawyer but not everybody is so therefore we need to use language uh, that most people understand and even I've heard of TikTok Stephanie uh, <laughs> uh, we're looking at skills in terms of how we support and develop students uh, with skills and here of course we need to embed within the curriculum yes it's great to have central resources and wonderful resources on, on websites and, uh, and and other areas but we need to make sure that students get access to those skills so we're looking at embedding within the curriculum some programs already do but this needs to be an institutional approach and at the right time so it's not just at the beginning within a week that inductions we know is not a, an event it's a process we have to have that same principle applying across what we do to support academic integrity and uh, skills uh, development and then finally we need to look at staff briefings that's another work strand that we're going to be looking at in terms of cpd for staff so yes we need cpd for students we equally need cpd for staff uh, making sure that staff will understand basically the importance of actually detecting uh, academic misconduct, how we go about supporting students in academic integrity uh, and, and indeed detection. Um, 
you know, we've heard often that some institutions don't seem to have a problem. Well, I think as the head of Texel once said, well, institutions think they haven't got a problem, they're not looking hard enough. Uh, and therefore we need to actually uh, train staff in, in detection processes and then how to support students in, in that uh, development as well, making sure our procedures and processes then are fair and are dealt with at a local level where appropriate. So we don't have a bunching at the top in terms of academic misconduct panels, which quite frankly, I suspect most institutions are finding it difficult to manage uh, if they continue with that particular uh, format and approach. So that's my quick whistle stop tour. Uh, five minutes, I hope I stopped the time, Billy. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, and now we're going to turn to the Irish context. And we're going to kick off with um, Ray Boland right, from QQI, who's going to talk to the Irish legislation and overview of that. Ray. Thanks, Billy. Hi, everybody. Lovely to, to be here with you all today. Um, so um, I am going to run you through um, the Irish situation. Um, you may be aware that Ireland has had legislation in place that criminalises um, the provision of cheating services um, and the advertisement and publication of, of advertisements for cheating services since 2019. So an amendment to, to QQI's founding legislation um, basically created these new offences. Um, and as in the UK, um, it's, it's not just essays or assignments. Um, it, it really is the facilitation of, of learner cheating um, that is a, a criminal offence, whether that is the undertaking an assignment on behalf of a, a learner uh, or an exam or providing an assignment or parts of a, an assignment to a learner um, to, to submit within their institution. Um, as I've said, advertising of cheating services are also, uh, that, that is also a criminal offence in Ireland, as is the publication of, of, of these. Um, Interestingly, and, and I suppose a bit different to um, the, the case in England, um, QQI was actually named as prosecutor in the Irish legislation for these offences. Um, so we are responsible for, for taking um, summary cases um, and then the Irish director of public prosecutions is, is responsible for taking um, in, or for bringing indictable offences. Um, I did. I heard Eve saying that in in the UK um, that it is that the legislation that the the offences um, are really solely targeting the commercial provision of um, of academic um, or of academic cheating services. In Ireland, that is not the case. It's actually um, the, the legislation is quite a bit broader. Um, so it, I suppose, it strictly on a strict interpretation it would actually incorporate cheating that's facilitated by friends or family. Um, but uh, I suppose that the real target of the legislation is um, that those cheating services that are organized and that are provided on a for-profit basis. Um, I suppose then um, the, the, other, the other thing to, to, um, to emphasize as Eve did was that those learners who themselves engage in, in cheating, so those learners who procure cheating services are not committing an offence under the Act. Um, it is really those who are, are providing those services and advertising those services. Um, I suppose Helen, had, Helen brought up earlier um, the value of the legislation and the value of the legislation um, in Australia in raising awareness and raising consciousness um, of the issue of academic misconduct. Um, and that really has been the case in Ireland. Um, we have found that that since um, the enactment of the legislation in 2019, there has been an enormous amount of work um, in, in Ireland um, and across the, the higher education sector in, I suppose, um, sustaining, maintaining, developing and embedding academic integrity cultures within our institutions. And that is large it, it, that is mainly down to the work of the national academic integrity network of which billy is chair um so qqi established that network shortly after the enactment of the legislation and we provide i think billy you've referred to to qqi as as the foundation the founding stone or the foundation of of the network providing that support but really the network itself is peer driven the work the resources that the network produces are um, by the, the higher education institutions and QQI's work in, I suppose, developing a policy framework for academic integrity 
um, is really informed by the work of the National Academic Integrity Network. Um, but I suppose just to, to give you just a little bit of background in terms of, of, of QQI's policy approach to implementing um, a, a, a policy framework to, uh, to the academic integrity legislation, it's important to know QQI is actually not only a quality assurance agency, we are also the National Qualifications Authority in Ireland, and we're a statutory awarding body um, in our own right. Um, so each of these hats really informs how QQI is and intends to implement um, our, our policy. So as, as a quality assurance agency, um, we have been embedding um, academic integrity considerations within reporting within annual reporting from our higher education providers. So we have a specific section within the annual quality report in which providers tell us what initiatives are happening within their institutions, what policy changes have happened um, over the during the reporting period. And that hopefully will give us a picture um, of on a national scale of, of what's happening um, across our institutions. Um, we also circulate a, a, a periodic academic integrity update. So similarly to Helen, um, we have a, a list that is ever growing of websites um, that websites and services that provide or may provide um, cheating services to students. And we share those with our with our um, all of our education providers, both higher education and further education and training. And that gives them the opportunity to block these websites on campuses which of course is again it's not a, it's not a silver bullet learners can of course access these uh, off campus these services but it does send a message to students um that that these that these websites the services they provide are illicit and they and they really shouldn't be it, it's 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 something that is not endorsed by the institutions um so that as, as that's just a brief overview as quality assurance agency of what we've been doing as a warding body um, I suppose one of the plans will be to embed academic considerations within our QA functions. So, for example, um, our program validation. So th those providers who are um, who are delivering programs leading to QQI awards, we would expect that they would give us details of how they um, put in place um, systems to ensure academic integrity within their provision on those programs. Um, as part of the program validation process. And I suppose it's also vital to note that um, QQI's position as awarding body means that we really need to work in partnership with our degree awarding bodies, our universities, our institutes of technology, our technological universities, um, on developing this a policy framework for academic integrity. So it really, again, as in, um, as in Australia, and as, as um, Michael has outlined in the UK, it really is a partnership approach in which we all need to be working together. Um, and I suppose then finally, as a qualifications authority, QQI is the custodian of the national framework of qualifications. So we're responsible for ensuring that, that, that any awards made within the national framework of qualifications are, are, are leveled to the, you know, at the correct level and that the integrity of the framework is maintained and academic integrity is a really, really important part of that. Um, so I suppose that that's just kind of a, a, a whistle stop tour of how um, how our policy framework is, is shaping up. It is still a work in progress, but um, I suppose I'll just, just leave you with, um, I suppose just, just leave you with, uh, by emphasizing that, um, again, we really are stronger together. We need to be working together um, as we've said already, as Helen said earlier on, you can't prosecute your way out of this problem. We need to be not only looking at legislation, um, but we also need to be looking at putting systems in place, supporting learners, supporting staff within institutions um, to, to combat contract cheating. Thank you very much. Right, uh, thank you for that. And now we're going to get the a uh, student perspective writer okay, Kate from Clauda McGivern, who is the, uh, from the Union of Students in Ireland. Uh, Clauda. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, just kind of wanted to say a few points in relation to the student perspective and um, academic integrity and misconduct and stuff. So um, one of the big things that I feel like we heard a lot about yesterday was like people discussing when does, you know, collaboration turn into collusion and 
I know from speaking to sabbatical officers on the ground, especially those who would have actually um, been at home studying uh, due to COVID and stuff, that um, whenever they were during that time, it was like extremely isolating. People were at home and they weren't able to engage with other students. And if they were engaging with other students, it was, you know, just little icons on the screen. And, you know, there are great resources that existed on campus, but they just weren't able to access them. So whenever people were in that situation and they found it so much easier to turn to sites like Course Hero and Chegg, especially when they're, you know, accessible 24-7. Um, so in relation to the discussion about yesterday and collaboration and collusion, um, that's when I thought, you know, that and I have thought about it for a long time, how we need to have safe spaces for students to collaborate and work together and Peer learning is something that is growing in popularity and I think that it really could be developed in um, a lot of institutions around Ireland. I know from my home institution in the University of Galway, they have came, which is the peer mentoring um, system that they have. And it's whenever first years um, are kind of taught necessary, like kind of taught by final year students. And the aims of the programme um, are to help develop first year's academic and life skills um, it's also used as a way to integrate them socially and widen their network so it allows them to get to know students obviously in their course in first year but also in the higher years and allows them to develop relationships with staff which is obviously extremely important whenever we're talking about student staff partnership and it helps them become more actively involved in discussing mat matters that are relevant to their learning and transition to higher education, which is obviously very daunting, you know, going from one education system to another and, you know, not knowing the nuances that exist. It's, it's a lot like it's a very big, you know, institution that you're going into and nobody really knows you whenever you were like, you know, a big fish in a small pond. Um, it also helps them collaborate with fellow students and gain greater understanding of, you know, their coursework. Um, so I think allowing them to have safe spaces where they can come together and actually collaborate with their work, but not to the point whenever it becomes, you know, collusion is so, so important. Uh, so we see that it increases their confidence. And this is something that continues to grow in university in Galway. There's new courses that are being developed every single year. Um, that are taken came on and it is so successful and I do think that it does act as a deterrent from actually engaging with those online um, sites whenever you're having healthy debates with people that did your course or you know are in your course at the minute. Um, another thing as well is that we see and we hear a lot of the time that people want to have um, a reform on assessment in universities and I think that it is so important that um, staff try to avoid you know recycling assignments um, whenever they can because I even know from um, you know a student that I knew in the past that had to repeat a year and they got the same assignment two years in a row and then they just submitted their work again because they thought it was my work I got a good grade on it last time so I'll just submit it again. And there's two issues that fall there. It's why did the student not understand that self plagiarism existed in the first place? And second of all, why was the assignment being recycled two years in a row? Um, so I think it's so important that, you know, students are able to engage with coursework that is different and new and not have something that, you know, was existing before because it just leads to students being able to copy another person's work and there's only so much like new information that a person can write before it's just repetitive um i think that it's also crucial that you know course coordinators and staff um in certain colleges and schools you know really do work together and try to bring in the concept of assignment mapping um we know how stressful it is whenever you have you know your exams due but whenever students have six assignments or assessments due in the space of two weeks, like that's incredibly stressful. Some institutions then have like really strict um, uh, deferral policies. So, or, you know, extension policies. So they might feel that they have no other option but to 
actually engage with these sites that would write the material for them. So we want to avoid that as much as possible, making sure that assessments are spread out, making sure that, you know, the amount of work that a student has to put into an assessment is proportionate to, you know, how much it's worth. Um, because there's a lot of time that students have very heavy assignments and, you know, the assessment might only be worth a few percentage and that could carry on for the rest of the year and it puts them under a lot um, of pressure. So I think, you know, we really need to make sure that learning outcomes are being met and that we're doing it in the most efficient way possible. Um, and another thing then as well, and it was obviously touched on prior, um, the importance of making sure that the policies that exist are accessible to students. Uh, there's no point using fancy words or jargon that only staff in the institutions can understand. Um, whenever the policies are there, they need to be communicated with students. Students need to understand, you know, the concept of them, why they exist. There's no point having um, policies that make students think that the university are against them without actually explaining to them why these exist and why the institution is a better place with policies like that existing. And another thing that um, is so important as well, especially around this area, is the need to have things like courageous conversations put into place for um, students. Like this actually helps benefit the students and the institution. So whenever, you know, a student is, you know, thought to have engaged in academic misconduct, to give them the opportunity to be open and honest about, you know, what they did is incredibly important because it keeps that dialogue open between staff and students. And, you know, it does build a relationship between them because um, we see that whenever the courageous conversations happen, um, you know, it's a chance for them to be honest. They will be punished, but not as harshly as they would have if they just, you know, stuck to their guns and was like, I did not engage in academic misconduct. And even at that, it gives the student a chance, hopefully, to do the assessment again. It's far more beneficial for them to actually do the assessment again instead of, you know, being capped and told you can't do it again. You're just going to be penalised on it because if they didn't do it, they're not going to grow as an academic if that's the end of it. And even whenever it does come to um, courageous conversations, you will be able to have a conversation with that student, ask them why they engage in the academic misconduct, how can it be avoided in the future, and find out if it was a site, what site was used, report it to QQI, you know, warn other students about it. So, like, it does create, you know, that open dialogue that, you know, really needs to exist between um, students and staff but um, they're just some of the uh, points that I kind of wanted to uh, touch on today and um, that's it thank you. Thank you very much Cloda. Um, now it turns to me right okay to talk a little bit about the institutional perspective in Ireland and uh, really the extent to which the National Academic Integrity Network has supported institutional policy and practice. So I'm, I'm going to give you a, a very quick history um, on this. We we have documentation, right, in terms of uh, principles, a lexicon, uh, guidance documents, right, okay, which we're happy to share, right, okay, with, with, with all on that. The network has been in place since November 2019, since the legislation um, uh, that Murray talked to was, was commenced. And Academic integrity policies across the sector uh, at that time largely reflected concerns about plagiarism. It was relatively little, right, okay, about uh, contract che cheating. And one of the purposes, in some sense, of the network is to create a non confrontational space for the higher education institutions. Higher education institu institutions, right, in Ireland and the UK have very high degrees of autonomy and they resent being told what to do, right, okay, by an, another authority. So it was much more important that, that they, in some sense, owned uh, the uh, solutions that were coming. It was clear to us and we did a survey of uh, the higher education institutions in Ireland in early 2020 that there was both very limited awareness right, of, of um, uh, academic integrity issues as they related to, particularly to contract cheating and there was almost no detection of that. And we weren't helped by having different 
policies in different institutions, but probably key different definitions and different taxonomies right, of uh, academic misconduct. So what the network did was it developed some, some principles around academic in, uh, integrity, broad principles, and you can look at them, and some of these are motherhood and apple pie, uh, rather than that. But a key document right, okay, that we produced was a lexicon, so that everybody uh, could work to the same kinds of definitions on, um, on that. And we produced guidance on this, and very much it was guidance, and well, guidance rather than direction, uh, reflecting this institutional uh, autonomy. And that uh, guidance uh, touched on four areas, upholding academic integrity, and then the, the next three were preventing, detecting, and um, uh, preventing and detecting academic misconduct, and finally dealing with academic misconduct. And the guidelines were addressed to all staff in the institution. So they weren't addressed to students, the first of these upholding academic integrity was talking about or talking to the responsibilities i think that both steph right and Claude have talked to is that teaching learning assessment policies have to promote positive behavior um consistent policies and procedures in, uh, in relation to academic uh, misconduct staff training and awareness raising in relation to academic integrity support for vulnerable students so it was really looking at what are our institutional responsibilities towards students and then the other parts were about our practices and processes right okay in relation to preventing th this uh, resources for staff, um, conversations with students throughout their entire period of enrollment. So this isn't something, right, okay, that is just done at the beginning, right, okay, but this is something that happens right the way through. Staff training and how to develop assessment methods, right, that are less susceptible to cheating, cheating practices. Managing the assessment schedule. So a lot of these things, right, okay, that have been touched on already detecting academic misconduct, agreed institutional policy so that the same thing was happening to students, whether they were in faculty A or a faculty B, right, that there was a consistency across the institution. And then in terms of dealing with academic misconduct, um, we're currently at the final point, right, okay, of developing a framework for academic misconduct investigation and case management. And again, guidance, right, okay, for institutions in terms of their how they might do it, the responsibilities, right, okay, towards students, and echoing in places, right, okay, what 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 Michael touched on earlier, right, okay, this is idea of restorative justice, right, okay, of finding a balance, right, okay, between educative and regulatory approaches, right, okay, to this, and there are some of those areas. What did we do, right, okay, the, uh, the, there's a sense in which low rates of detection, uh, I think, represented, uh, at least in part, a fatalism on the part of institutions, that there was nothing that they could um, uh, do about that. And what we've done as a network, right, okay, with the support of QQI, is we've set out to raise awareness uh, through international webinars we held in May of this year, and this really was an, a nudge initiative, masterclasses drawing on experience, right, okay, from colleagues in the University of New South Wales about detection and trying to reach into the senior leadership of institutions, right, and doing this. And what we're seeing as a result of that is we're seeing policies, right, okay, being consistently updated across institutions. But we recognize that this is a journey this is not, there isn't a, a single fix on this, and it will be an iterative process, right, okay, that institutions have to find their own individual way with this at, at a pace that works for them and for their learners. I'm quite conscious of time now, so I, that was very much a, a quick run, right, okay, at what uh, the network has done, but as I say, we'll, um, the, the documents are, are, are uh, publicly available and everybody's will, uh, welcome to look at them. We're more or less out of time, but I just want to, um, first of all, acknowledge there's some really good comments right in in, in the chat. And some of these we'll, uh, we'll take away, right, okay, and, and work further with. Um, any last comments from members of the panel? Thanks, Billy. It's just great to be with 
like-minded colleagues doing some great work in this area. The fact we've got the number of participants we have for this particular webinar as well just shows how committed both students and staff are to academic integrity. So um, as always, I think, continue with the good work, Billy. As I said yesterday, there's, there's no gain without name. Mm. Adam, Adam I, I, I see the point, right, okay, that you made in the chat, right, okay, and I, I think, will we, will we, at any point in time, will we win? No, we won't, but we can disrupt the activities. Working together, we can disrupt the activities of those who would prey on our students. I think one thing I would add is that one thing that's been very clear throughout is that it is a wicked problem and SA mills in particular will get more clever they'll, they'll, and they'll keep reaching out. It means that we can't be complacent and go, well, we've solved it now. Mm. It is going to be an ever living thing that we are going to have to keep doing, just like we should keep doing developing coursework, not using the same thing over and over again, development. We just need to keep doing it. Otherwise, we will get back to a point where we have to keep going over the same things again. So it is an ever-changing thing. It's never going to be perfect, but as long as we keep going at it, at least the public as such can be reassured that we are taking action on it uh, internally. Yeah, I, I, I think that's... Nice. Say, sorry. sorry, I was just going to say, that's why I think it's so crucial that we induct our students into this positive integrity culture, because the threat will change. We've got... AI coming along now, um, threatening to displace the SA mill. So students being inducted into a culture where they really take pride in the fact that they're they're in higher education and developing the skills, knowledge and experience to be an expert. That's our best defence. Thanks, Helen. I'm going to um, bring this to a close so that we finish right again okay, within the alloc allocated hour. Uh, uh, thank you all, Right Okay, for your participation. Thanks to the panel, Right Okay, for your contributions. And uh, thanks to so many of you contributing, Right Okay, in the chat. And uh, I hope, Right Okay, we have contributed, Right Okay, to uh, this dealing with, Right Okay, uh, to tackling this shared challenge. And it is a shared challenge across all our institutions and jurisdictions. Thank you all very much.